morning. And I just want to say thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, because this week, one of my cousins had surgery for uh, cancer, pancreatic. And you know, we found out that it had moved to her liver. But we know that God is good. Hallelujah. And you know, thank you, Lord. She's been with this man for 30 something years, and they ain't never been married. They ain't thought about getting married. But you know when she laying on that bed, looking all ugly and all that kind of stuff and just had surgery? Yesterday he gave her, I don't know how many carats of diamond ring it was, but he, she laid up there in that bed. And what did she say? Oh, yes, honey, I'll marry you. But God is good in spite of all of that. Hallelujah. And you know what? I was trying to tell her. I said, you know what? Them doctors said, baby, you got six months to a year. But they don't have the final say. Hallelujah. We're a family. And we're going to be in this thing together. And we're going to be praying. Hallelujah. That God might give you five years. Ten years. Hallelujah. Because we don't know what God has in store for her. So this morning, I'm happy. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just happy this morning. You know what? And I sat up there and I said, you know what? I'm being a little bit selfish with my son, you know, the one that's in prison because I was so mad with him. Hallelujah. He had been there for a whole year before I went to see him one time. But last Tuesday, when I went to see him on last Tuesday, and I took my granddaughter with me, and you know what? He was talking to her about his little boyfriend that she got and about drugs and all that kind of stuff. And he told her, he said, Kia, do you want to have to come and visit him up in here like I am right now? I looked at him. I said, oh, my God, is that you talking? Do you realize what you're saying? He said, Mom, I know. He said, but this time, hallelujah, let's pray with the church, that this time he'll realize what it is that he has done and he don't ever want to go back there again. And I just thank and praise God. You know that there's somebody in there talking to him and praying with him and all that kind of stuff. When he first went, I don't mean to take up all y'all's time. When he first went in there, he come telling me about he going to be a Muslim. I said, you can be anything you want to be up in there. But when you come home, you're going to forget all about that Muslim stuff. Because the Muslims ain't doing nothing for you. It's God, honey child. So you know what? I just thank God. And I praise him this morning for the song because God is real. Yes, he's real in our lives, y'all. too because that's family but I can't do all that long walking from the gate 10 miles up to the stadium and all that and I said I'm going to be at Mount Elon this morning praising God that they will you know walk on down the aisle and be happy and we're going to be happy for all of them right here praising God this morning and I thank you Sister Canteen and I know you get ready to leave us soon but it's going to be all right because we know that God is real and he is going to be in our home hallelujah we just want to thank him this morning. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus, for your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'm sorry, Reverend Green. Amy. I'm uh, uh, sorry about what? No, baby. Uh-uh. What are we sorry for?
when we used to be uh, exchanging pulpits with uh, Weeping Mary Baptist Church down there in, in, in uh, Salisbury, Maryland. Amen. And they called themselves Holy Ghost headquarters in Maryland. And we was Holy Ghost headquarters in, in, in Delaware. Now, you know, folks got problems because our name is. Uh, they got Baptists out there on, on the thing right now. Amen. Praise God. And they feel like, you know, Baptists do that. Amen. Praise God. Mm-hmm. Baptists both don't, but children die. Right. Amen. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? Amen. We ain't hung up on no name out there on that door. Whatever it is that the Holy Ghost wants to have done up in here, I'm free to do it. I ain't, got, I ain't hung up on no whole lot of crazy doctrine. If it's in the Bible, it's in my meaning. Amen. Praise God. If that's what the Holy Ghost says, do. If he says run, run. Amen. Come on, y'all. He says dance, dance. Praise God. Come on. He says clap your hands, and I'm going to do it. I don't know what y'all going to do, but I'm going to do it. Because sometimes you got to shake that stuff off you. Sometimes you come in burdened. You got to get it off you. Amen. And the only way you can get it off is run the house. Run the house. The only way you can get it off is kick your feet. Kick your feet. Amen. And praise God, the Lord is giving you. If you finally yielded to the knowledge of the fact that you got to, can have another language, and you and the Holy Ghost are talking. Now, when you are talking to church, but if it's you and Jesus, talk to him. Talk to him. Praise God. Let him hear it from you. Amen. And sometimes it takes getting with your brothers or your sisters. Yeah, you can praise God at home. But every now and then you need to get somewhere rough. You know, get a rub with somebody else. Praise God. And let it rub off on you. Amen. And just let him have a way. You know, but I'm going to get here in a minute. I just need to, I need to calm down a little bit. All right. I just need to calm down a little bit. Amen. 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 The devil wants us to think that a lot of people are going to be out today. And they are. But but you know what? Hold that. He's at graduation, but some kind of way he worked himself up in here too. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't know about the God you serve, but the God I serve is just good. It's just good. It's just a canteen. I ain't glad you kill me. But if you're going to sing like that, you're going to say, oh Jesus, you can come there every time you talk to me. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We realize it was the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you know what? You got to get the flesh out of the way so that the Spirit can do what he wants to do. Sometimes he has to work through broken flesh. Sometimes he has to work through tears and situations that you're going through. You know what? Sometimes when we come in feeling good, and then we base what we do on what we feel. All right. When you come in and you ain't feeling so good, you know you ain't had nothing to do with that song, we had nothing to do with it. Amen. Praise God. But God did. And not just that song, but the choir sang. They're singing anyway. And I want to let them know how much, how much we appreciate it. Last Sunday we had four men up in this in this in this choir box. And they told the church up. Four men. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Brother, thank you for coming in with us today and Coming out over on the drums, amen. And when you go to your church next week, just tell your pastor you was with some good people. We good people. We know we good people. Amen. Praise God. We say it boastfully. We good people because we God's people. Amen. We do honor the Lord this morning to my husband and to all the ministers, all the officers, to everybody, everybody, to amen, to all of our ministries, to everybody, everybody, everybody. Amen. As I was out greeting with our little song, and sometimes when we don't have visitors and we still sing that song, amen, it's all right, because you know what, that does give us an opportunity to come out and hug each other. And sometimes, you know what, I don't know about y'all, but sometimes we just need a hug. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have anything to do with sexuality. It's just the fact that there's a brother or a sister that you need to hug. And I needed a hug from that little skinny woman right back up in there that had bad feet, and now her feet are getting better. Amen. And she just wanted me to know she's been out for a while. She's in and out, in and out, but she's finally getting them feet right. Sister Lois, brother and sister Lois. And she had made sure she sashayed up to let me see she's got heels on today. Amen. Amen. She told that doctor a long time ago when he told her something he said to her about her heels. And she wanted to know when you're going to get back in the heels. And he told her, I don't know what he told her, but you know what? Next time you go to him, wear your heels so he can see them. Or carry them in the bag anyway so he can see that you're back. And she let me know, I'm getting there, Pastor. I'm getting there. And I'll be back on for soon. Amen. We want him to know we miss him, but we, we understand. And we thank God. I'm just happy today to have Reverend John and Sister Vermel back. They were out last week. Okay, now wait a minute. Hold on. Yeah, you, John. 
Wait a minute. Let's see. Who is he? Oh, shoot. Well, anyway, wherever you are, Reverend John, you're in the building. Amen. And Brother Tamir got us hooked up so we can hear all over the church. So wherever you are, I'm glad you're back this morning. Amen. Praise God. He was on duty last week with a friend that was uh, ill, and he had to preach to them. We definitely didn't miss you. Amen. We're glad to see you back. And we praise God that we have ministers that the Lord will use other places. And I understand that I evangelized for a long time. And I do understand when there is outside calling, as well as the fact that there's plenty of work to be done in the house. And we thank God for you. Amen. Amen. We're not going to be before you long. That's why I keep talking. I ain't got much this morning. Praise God. We went to the play last night at the Milford High. No more drama. And it was a good play. And the thing is, I think the young man is really trying to get, start, get his career off the ground, uh, somewhat like Tyler Perry. Uh, the play reminded me a lot of Tyler Perry's play. Uh, nevertheless, it was a good play, but I was not happy. It started supposedly at 6. And, of course, you know, it was our time, so it didn't start right at 6. But at t uh, quarter after 10, they were at in intermission. That was a little bit too much play for me. A little too much play for me. And they had five more scenes to go after intermission. So by this time, we were telling the actors what to do next. Ah, go get him, get him, bring him back, come on. Time for you to do this. But, you know, because it was time to go home. Amen. But it was, a, it was a nice play. And it was, again, like I said, he's trying to start his career. And we're trying to help him get along. But it was just a little too long for me. And I said that to say that, um, I guess that's why I would explain why I ain't got much. Okay. Anyway. I had done this before I left, though, so that ain't no excuse. Anyway, we praise God this morning. It sounds like I'm just gibbering on, and I am. Amen. I'm trying to calm down. <laughs> praise God. I see my granddaughter's in the house this morning, and she fought the little ones. All right. We've got Sister... I'm going to Diavion. The name's... <laughs> oh, granddaughter Diavion, wave your hand. And then there's Lord Joshua... The on you one in the bunch. And then there's Pop Pop's heart, William, up under him. Amen. And Sister Susie, we want to put them on board. Amen. Praise God. They're here with mommy. I don't know if she's gonna when they're gonna join, but we do want to put them on board with our young people. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And with all that said, let's look at where we're going this morning. Our thought is just one look. Just one look. Looking at the word look it has multiple meanings. First of all, it means to turn your eyes toward. It also means to examine with the eyes. To pay attention to or to direct attention to. To consider or even to incline toward. Now each of these uh, uh, messages that uh, I'm going to share with you today, and it's really one message, but each of the thoughts is befitting, I'm sorry, each of these meanings are befitting for our message today. Because we want to look at the concept of looking, and we want to look at it from two particular views or two particular stories. One from those needing to look due to failures of their own, and then those needing to look due to failures that they have no control over. Those that have failed, but they have no control over the fact that the failure came. And then those that failed because of their own doings, their own choices. And so we will look and see the benefit of how looking can help in each of these situations. Realizing that the action of looking goes far beyond the activity of the eye. It is the action that brings about the result. But we need to be aware of the truth that the eye is not the most important participant in this looking. Okay? The eye can in some cases be a hindrance. It can cause the results to be marred or totally misconstrued. Nevertheless, it is the eye that we focus on to get us started with the benefits of seeing. And so to begin with our assignment for today, let's say that our physical sight brings to us our mental, our emotional, and our spiritual being, the image that it will either make 
or break us. Let me say that again. That our physical sight brings us to our mental, our emotional, and our spiritual selves. And the image that we pick up with the physical sight can either make us or break us. And that was something we talked about in the uh, executive staff meeting the other day about how sometimes we either have to put sunglasses on and look down, put shielders over our eyes, turn the other way, amen, so that we don't get in trouble and that we don't turn other people away because of the fact that the way they present themselves. It will either make us or break us. And so that's why we must be as we talked about God being, we must be real. And we must be real careful of what we are uh, uh, stating, our reasoning or our, our, our uh, abilities or our looking, uh, uh, focusing in on. We must know the state of our reasoning. What state are we in as we are looking and as we are uh, 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 reasoning about what we see? First of all, are we in a critical state? That no matter what we look, look, look at, it's always from a critical standpoint. No matter what it looks like, you can find something wrong with it. And you've got some people that no matter what's going on, they see something critical in it. Well then, are we in a state of finding blame mentally? Ain't my fault. It's her fault. His fault. Their fault. Again, if you are in that state, whatever you see, you're going to blame it on someone else. Are we in the uh, uh, frame of mind where we find multiple excuses? Whatever we see and the way we explain it, we've got an excuse for why we see it that way and why it looks like it, it, it is. Now, not only should we be concerned about what state we're in, we need to be where we are, know where we are. First, where are you physically? Are you in the right place at the right time? Have you allowed yourself to be where it is that you're supposed to be? And as I think back about the, uh, the years that I was out there in the world and think about a lot of times places that I wasn't supposed to be, I can remember my sister used to tell my mother she was taking me out with her to the movie, and I, I think I shared this before I'd be at the chicken shack. Those of you who know about the chicken shack, you can get some joy out of that because you know that's just what it was, a shack. And all kind of stuff was going on down there. And at 16 and 17, I ain't had no business down there, but my sister took me and my mother trusted her. And so physically, I wasn't where I was supposed to be, so that meant that I wasn't seeing what I should have been seeing. Well, where are you not only physically, but where are you mentally? Where is your mental state? as you're looking at whatever it is you need to be looking at. And last but not least, where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? You know, it's ironic how our spiritual well-being has to placate all those other physical, mental states of being. Because if we're all physically, our spiritual well-being suffers. If we're off mentally, our spirit being is the one that suffers the most. If we're feeling poorly and we ain't in the mood for praising God or we ain't in the mood for praising anybody else, when the spirit man wants to rise up, when the spirit man wants to clap his hands, when the spirit man wants to say amen, I don't feel like it. Sit down, spirit. Shut up. Not today. If we're mentally fatigued, we don't want nobody telling us, come on, y'all, give God praise. And I'm so glad we have advanced from the way we used to be years ago where we would have everybody to stand, y'all remember. And we say on the count of three, everybody say amen. And on the count of three, that's just what they said, amen. And I'm so glad we graduated from that. Yeah, you had some people that you could excite and they would get with it, but most of the people just said it because you said to say it. And so when we're mentally fatigued, we're on the body sitting next to the time. Come on, praise the Lord. Because we ain't in the mood for doing it. And so there again, the spiritual man suffers. Okay? And then we must remember that the spirit man is all about giving God his due. So he ain't worried about the fact that your corn's hurt. 
He just wants you to get up and dance if the song warrants it. He ain't basing his actions on the other facets of man. He just knows that he is in the image of God and he wants to give God his praise. He's living in you. He's in God's image. And he wants you to let go and let him praise God because he knows that's what his purpose is. If he ain't in charge, he's respectful. He won't push you out there. He won't uh, uh, try to make the other parts of you agree. He'll just calm down and let you mentally or physically move the way you want to move. And so now with that, let me take you into my story because you're looking at me like, where is she going? Let's go to Numbers 21. Numbers 21. And basically, I want to do verses 8 and 9. I'm going to kind of draw from the story, but I want to look at verses 8 and 9 in Numbers 21. Numbers is found after Leviticus. And it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You might figure out where I'm going now. Well, let's look at the story. The Israelites are in the wilderness. They are en route to the Red Sea. And they've already encountered the Canaanites, and they had a fierce battle with them. They asked God during this battle to give them victory. And God being God, he gave it to them. And so now they've approached Edom. And they want to go through Edom to make the passageway short. But the Edomites forbid them to come through. So this means they've got to go all the way around to get where they're trying to go. Now, right away, they begin murmuring and complaining. Just that fast, they forgot that God had gotten them out of Egypt, allowed the, uh, the, uh, the, those pursuing them, amen, to not be able to catch up with them, had brought them where they are, allowed them to uh, uh, over overwhelm the Canaanites, and just this quick, they started murmuring and complaining. They're tired, and they become discouraged. And so this also brings about destruction, which has a cause for salvation. Let's look at the discouragement. They're murmuring and they're bickering. They started because they were not granted what they wanted, and that was a shortcut to Edom. And so they turned their bickering to the fact that they didn't have the provisions that they felt they needed. You know how we do sometimes, it's one thing wrong over here, but because we can't do nothing about that, we'll turn it to make it look like there's something wrong over here. And so in the meantime, praise God, they took their murmuring and their complaining and attacked Moses. They said Moses is the force that brought them to where they are now. And so they could have still been in Egypt saying that they would have been content there. But remember, they were not content in Egypt. They were in slavery. And so mind you, they are at this particular point already beyond where they were supposed to go because they were supposed to leave Egypt and go to Canaan. And you just heard me say that they had defeated the Canaanites. And so already they are beyond where they were supposed to go. But you see, they had bad attitudes and just keep looking this way and nobody will know that you're guilty sometimes. Their attitudes were so nasty and so negative that God caused them to delay entering in Canaan. And this is what caused them to have the Canaanites at war. So they were discouraged because they felt 
that they were traveling a hard way. That had they stayed in Egypt, they would not be encountering all this traveling and all this hardship. They also felt that they were going in circles because the way that they wanted to go was not leading them to the destination that they felt that they were supposed to conquer. And so they were aggravated with Moses because Moses didn't seem to have all the answers now that he had when he convinced them to leave Egypt. So they turned it on Moses. It's Moses' fault. Now, mind you, Moses was a part of them. He had nothing to do with the fact that the Edomites would not let them pass through. But they couldn't blame nobody else, so they blamed Moses. Keep looking this way because we've been guilty. Things don't go the way we want, that we can find 23,000 reasons and people that we can blame. Amen, lights. They began to cry about the provisions that God had given them. You know, he had given them the manna. And then they began to complain about the water situation. So they began to pick stuff apart. Just find stuff to just pick apart. Just so that they could be bickering and murmuring and complaining. And my question to you today is, have you been there? Tired? And things ain't going well? And if it ain't one thing, as Reverend Samuel used to say, it's another. Went to the doctor just for a checkup, and the blood pressure was high. The refrigerator won't cool, get cool, and when you went to check it, you found out that the electricity had a problem. Just stuff. Always one thing or another. You fix this, that breaks down. You get the blood pressure down, the cholesterol's up. Come on, y'all. Amen. Praise God, you cut the grass today and raise the night, you got to cut the grass again tomorrow. Praise God, hallelujah, you got new tires on the car, then the engine goes up. Always something, praise God, for you to have a reason to be discouraged. And so along with the discouragement, you know, we begin to say stuff, y'all. We begin to do stuff. We begin to find ourselves in situations where we're just negative and critical about everything. And so when all that happens, then we enter into that destruction mode. You see here, they're angry. They pulled away from all that they were connected to on this journey, amen, to help them to get through the doors that needed to be opened for them. Pulled away from Moses. Moses, who had the connection with God. So that means they pulled away from God. They lose, lose heart and they lose faith in the system that put them where they, praise God, were delivered from the bondage of slavery. The place where uh, the, the doors that will be open for them are open and the doors that need to be closed were closed. They've allowed themselves to enter into a destruction period which automatically leads to death. Maybe not death where they've got to put you in the ground, but death to the situation. You've gotten upset on the job and so you uh, 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 came in a negative and a critical spirit. And here you were being considered for a promotion. But all of a sudden your attitude is so nasty, death to that promotion. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And so as we look at the fact that they went from discouragement to destruction, death that opens the door for Satan's attacks. And then the mind begins to alienate itself from the protection of the Holy Spirit. And so then we have anger that has set in and negativity reigns. God was already disgusted with them at this point. And so what did he do? He allowed the serpents. Now, you have to know, church, that the serpents were already there. They were in the wilderness. And so they were amongst all kind of poisonous and aggravated animals and whatnot. But at this particular point, God had gotten disgusted with them. Isn't it funny how we never think about the fact that we can disgust God? Because you always talk about the fact that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. But I beg to say to you this morning, do you love your children? Yeah, you do. But don't they disgust you? Can you just hear Sister Jean say she was disgusted with that son? Amen. But if you would ask her, did she love him? Sure she does. And so that's how it is with God. He does get disgusted with us. And especially back during the time when the blood had not come yet. And we couldn't hide up under that blood. And so at this point he was disgusted with them. And so he allowed the serpents to attack them. And when the serpents, uh, uh, serpents attacked them, many of them died. And thus they began to cry out to Moses. Now remember they mad with Moses. Remember he's the one that brought him out there and got him in the mess. 
But when they saw there was nothing else that they could do and they were literally dying, they called on Moses. Talk to God. Fix this situation. See, they had failed to be thankful for the mercy that God had showed them in the beginning. And so, as I said, they had unjustly complained that Moses had brought them out of Egypt for them to die. And so, therefore, they put those words in, in them, uh, uh, let those words in, uh, out of their mouths, as a matter of fact. They said, you brought us out here to kill us, for us to die. And you know, church, unhappy, disgruntled people open the door for poison to infiltrate their bodies and minds. How? By the words that they speak. And the Bible tells us that. You get what you say. You say, I'm sick of this man. I'm sick of this woman. I don't want to be in this marriage any longer. And somewhere down the line, something comes up. And you wonder what happened. You say, characters in my family, you know what? I, who knows? And then somewhere down the line, you look up. And then there's a test, and it comes back, and them cancer cells are flurring. We talk about the job. I'm sick of this job. I need to find another one. Now, in the meantime, you ain't doing nothing to find another one, but you're sick of that one. And you grumble, and you complain about it, and you look up, there's a pink slip. Hello? My children, you're always doing something. Every time I turn around, you're in trouble. So why is it the school keeps calling you? You keep making the public announcement, bringing it on yourself. And so we find lots of situations happen. Friends leave, people die, things happen as a result sometimes of the fact that we run off at the lip. And so you see, this is what they said. You just brought us out here so we could die, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And looked up, many of them did die. Well, I said they went from discouragement to destruction, which led to salvation. And so here we are. As they begin to cry out to Moses, Moses begins to intervene to God. And in there, on their behalf, God instructs Moses to build a serpent and to hang it on a pole above them. And when they saw what Moses was doing, they began to confess their sin and how they were wrong and how they were uh, with the attitudes and whatnot. And they begin to return to their original place where they were with the provisions and all that God has supplied. Scared now. So they turned away from the way they were going and came back to Moses, who was their salvation at that time. And so Moses built the serpent. And in my research, I found that he built a bronze or a brazen serpent. And the purpose of it, uh, of it being bronze was so that it would look as close to the real serpent as possible with the color situation. Because you know what? A lot of research in there, but I don't want to go that way today. But this bronze serpent, you remember, represented Jesus. And so he made that serpent and had to put it on the pole. And don't you remember God? Uh, the, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And so that salvation had to be lifted up and raised upon the pole. And see, the serpent, the purpose of it was to remind them that they had brought this upon themselves. But God had plans for this instrument of corruption. It was, as I said, a representation of our Lord Jesus. He was the bearer of the sin for us in the days of the cross. And so the serpent itself was a representation of sin. And the fact that when they looked at that serpent, that serpent would bear their sin. Symbolic, I know, but it had a, a, a value uh, upon it. He represented the sin. That serpent represented the sin. And as Jesus was made uh, uh, to take our sins, this serpent was to take all this that the Israelites had allowed to come upon them. It also represented a curse because you know anytime you're dealing with a serpent, you're dealing with that with the, a curse. And the word tells us that cursed is he that hung on a tree. So they had to take that serpent representing curse and hang it on the tree again to take the curse away from the people. So again, he's representing Jesus. 
as the, the, the uh, uh, serpent was hung on the cross. Now, while the serpent was instrumental in bringing about the deliverance needed to heal those that had been bitten, amen, had they not followed the direction, and this is where I'm coming today, had they not followed the directions to look at that serpent, they would still be gone. Not just the serpent. Not just the fact that they hung on the tree. And not just the fact that they repented of their sin. But the fact was, the serpent was hung and they were told all of those that would look at the serpent would be healed. I tell you, it was all in the look. Because you see, the look constituted faith. You know we say faith that our works is dead. They could have had faith to believe when Moses said to them, this serpent is going to represent your healing. They could have had the faith to believe that, Dr. Davis, but had they not looked at that serpent, they still would not be healed. And many times that's where we are. i got faith to believe God can do it, but I've got to have the action that goes with that faith. And that action is to believe and to look. And this is what they told. They, they were told, look at the serpent. They had to believe that this was the answer to the problem, and they had to follow suit. And so no matter how many ways that they thought they may be able to get out, the one thing that they had to do was to look. Just one look. No, how, no matter how much the serpent on the pole reminded them of the real one, and I don't know about you, but I don't like snakes. I don't watch them on TV. I don't look at pictures of snakes. I don't like toy snakes. I don't like anything that wiggles like that as it's going across the, the, the ground. And so I don't know about them, but for me it may have been a little hard to look up at that pole and see that grass snake. Hallelujah. But had I been back there then and not looked at the snake, guess what? I would have been dead too. So I understand the ramifications of the fact that they had to turn around and look up at that thing that had caused them to die. Hallelujah. And yet, this was going to bring light. Come on, y'all. Somebody get with me this morning. They had to look. No matter how and what way that they thought that they get out of it. The one thing that God said, tell them to take one look. And as they looked at the serpent, they would be healed. Hallelujah. No matter what somebody says about how insane it was to look, you better look. In order to get healed. Now how many times people try to convince you that all that jumping and howling and screaming and whatnot ain't necessary. And yet you know, praise God, that sometimes that's the only way you can get your deliverance. And so I don't care who's sitting next to you in service. And they get irritated with you because you say amen, hallelujah. You keep right on saying amen, hallelujah. They don't know what your amen, hallelujahs is doing for you. Every now and then somebody will tell you that that ain't necessary. That's too much. God don't expect this. Ain't no way in the world it says to do this and do that. But if you know that's what it takes to get you healed, to get you delivered, to get your mind elevated, you ignore what's around you. And you do just what it is that you know you need to do. You need to look at the serpent. Look at the serpent. If you decide you want to live, take the look. Just one look. Well, now let's look. I, I set our focus. We talked about the look. Amen. Calm down, Patricia. We talked about the look that came as a result of someone who caused themselves to fail. You got to know they caused themselves to be in the situation because of choices. Let's go to Acts 3. Amen. Acts, the third chapter. Leave that one alone. The fact that somebody looked and they were healed. Let's go to Acts, the third chapter. Praise God. Familiar stories, both of them. Very familiar stories. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. Acts 3, 8 through 10.
as a matter of fact, it's only a few short verses. Let me start at one. I know you know the story, but I want to refresh your mind. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, lame from his mother's womb, born that way, ain't his fault, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter, fasting his eyes upon him with John, said, here we go, look on us. Look at your neighbor and say, look on us. All right, and he gave heed <laughs> unto them. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I to thee. In the name of, the, of, of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately, and immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping and uh, stood up, I'm sorry, and he leaping stood up and walked and entered into the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And I guess the, the main verse that I really wanted was, and he, where is it? It was verse 5. And he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something of them. Here we have a beggar. He's down because of his fate in life. He's down because of something that was no fault of his own. He's not begging because he's lazy. Not down because he made poor choices like the Israelites. Not down because he denied Jesus. For this is shortly after the, uh, uh, the uh, reaching out to the Gentiles and the beginning of the church. Not where he is because he's trying to get something for nothing. You know, we always look at folks that are down and think that they, you know what, they just want something for nothing. Get out and get a job. This was not his situation. Everybody going through church, it ain't their fault. Some are down legitimately, believe it or not. Nevertheless, this man is down. He is a beggar. He is a nobody to many. He is to be ignored by some saints. He is considered just an old beggar. Now, we would say, let welfare take care of him. After all, the church ain't no insurance company. I've heard it said many times. We ain't no social services. Take him to James Williams building. They got something up there for beggars. But let's get our eyes off the ignorance of mankind and try to be merciful to those who are less fortunate and let's look at our beggar here. It seems to have been well versed that, uh, and what, I'm sorry, he seems to be well versed in what he's doing. And so I would say he's been doing it for a while. No doubt he had certain personalities that he kind of catered to. Kind of looked at some people and could figure out that they would be the ones that would help me. So perhaps he was already in the know about which people to approach. He hit the jackpot now when he looked at these two as they approached the entrance of the temple. And he asked as he had been accustomed to doing, alms, please, alms. But he was given an answer, amen, that perhaps he had never been given before. It wasn't just a no. It wasn't just an evil eye, as many people had probably given him before. He was given an answer that made a world of difference in his life. He wasn't given a fish. He was given the ability to go fishing. A million dollars in his cup could not have compared to what he got this day. He had not given, I'm sorry, had not given vent to the directions. I mean, had he not given directions to the vent given him, he would still be begging. He, if he had decided to ignore them, thinking that they were just too hard-hearted men, inconsiderate, he'd still be there begging today. But you see, we can't stop there because it wasn't just any look that helped him to get out of it. 
Praise God. It was a look of expectation. Read it. It said he gave heed unto them expecting to receive something from them. And so when he was told, look on us, he didn't have out of the look, but he looked as if to say, I'm looking. What you got for me? What can you give me? Hallelujah. And that look of obedience made a difference in his life today. We are told that God heals. And we say we believe it. But do we look for it with expectation? Come on, y'all. We are told that God saves. And we say we believe it. But do we look for it with expectation? You know, we base salvation on a feeling. Somebody said, I got saved today. How did it feel? Now, I don't know about you, but when I got saved, I didn't feel a whole lot different. Amen. I was excited, but I didn't quite understand all that had happened. But I can't tell you that I had a feeling. And yet, he looked with expectations. We believe that God delivers, but do we expect him to deliver? You know, those around us that are going through? We say that he fixes marriages, but do we look for it with expectation? That he takes us through our situation. But do we look for it with expectation? That he fights our battles. But do we expect him to fight it? If so, why are we putting on the boxing gloves? Amen. Yes, we pray the prayer. We say the words. But where do we put our eyes? On the answer or on the situation? When we look with expectation, do we not consider, amen, that we can't watch the clock? because God didn't tell us when he was going to do it, that we not watch the calendar because he didn't tell us what day he was going to do it, or do we totally look at him and say, God, you said you would do it. This man looked at Peter and John with expectation, but it just so happened at this particular point that he got what he was looking for immediately when he looked for it. And in both instances that I've given you this morning, and I'm ready to take my seat, the word said, look. But it must be a look with expectation. One situation was self-caused, and yet what did God say? He said, look. The other situation was not his fault, but it was the same God, and it was the same word. The word was look. Praise God. Look at the serpent. He represented Jesus. The serpent, praise God, lets us know that Jesus took all the evil that we deserve. The serpent says there was a curse, but Jesus took the curse and fixed it. Looking at the serpent, the serpent let us know that all the hurt and pain went away as a result of us looking. And then when we look, as I said, praise God, and people think we're crazy for looking, we realize, amen, that that expectation that goes along with that look is what brings us to where we receive what it is that God has promised us. And so today, serpents, not as serpents, but as serpents, let us look to Jesus. Yes, let's look to Jesus. And let us realize that no matter what it is today, that you need, he said, take a look. Take a look. And of course, as I thought about my song, I thought of a message from the Lord. Hallelujah, page one, I'm sorry, two, yeah, 136, I've got it marked. I have a message on your feet, please, from the Lord, hallelujah, a message, oh my friends, for you, it's recorded in his word, hallelujah, Jesus said it, and I know it's true. This is what I want from it. Look and live. My brother lives. Look to Jesus now and live. It's recorded in his word. Hallelujah. And it's only that you look and live. I have a message from the Lord. Hallelujah. A message on oh my
in the Garden of Gethsemane? If you tell him on your knees, he will hear you and will give you ease. one in our midst really has no idea what we're talking about when we're talking about looking to Jesus have not taken that time yet to allow Jesus to be that salvation to deliver us from the discouragement and the destruction that comes about amen as we get angry and bitter and sad and withdrawn we'll come and make Jesus amen the answer Jesus the one that you're going to look to if there's one in our midst this morning who is not saved it's recorded in his word, hallelujah, and it's only that you look and live. Amen. At this time, I extend it. anyone who desires prayer, that you might come and one of our officers or one of our ministers will pray with you. If you desire prayer, I heard Sister Jean talk about a cousin that the doctors have already given up because of cancer, and I've heard Amen. Incidents when people have been given a space of time to live that they've outlived. I remember Joel Osteen's mother who was dying of liver cancer. And they said, take her home and let her die. And that was almost 40 years ago. Amen. Why don't you come? Praise God. Amen. Those that desire prayer. If you don't need prayer for yourself, those that desire prayer for a loved one. Amen. Praise God. Amen.